I remember went to my first martial arts teacher and he says, do you want to be great? I say, yeah, I want to be great. He says, then first learn how to heal people to be great. <laughs> Anytime you Steven Seagal story, because I collect those stories like right. jewels. I like love I love that. the Jamie Presley one. Where like, I'm an expert in shiatsu massage. Please let me massage you. You know, you told me that one. And she, <laughs> next thing you know, she's having her boobs grabbed on by him. <laughs> let me give me those titties, baby. <laughs> What's the Steven Seagal video without a couple of jokes? But we're gonna get a little more serious here. So welcome to a positive video on Steven Seagal. Now I've seen videos on YouTube comprised of his various fight scenes, and I think people put him up as a way to show respect for the man. But I never really seen a video that talked about him in a positive light. Just just a positive tone overall so this may be a first and only on YouTube in general I feel like there's way too much negativity directed towards this man but that's not even an accurate enough or a strong enough word I'll downright say it there's a lot of hate when it comes to Steven Seagal what? I hate him sometimes I just fucking <laughs> hate him what? oh my god <laughs> and depending on the stories you may have heard which may or may not be true but were the very least exaggerated some of it may be justified but I don't believe in throwing the baby out with the bathwater rejecting the favorable with the unfavorable when it comes to Steven Seagal let's take a page out of the Bloodsport book when Van Damme says keep an open mind so I urge you guys to at least keep an open mind during this video and maybe by the end of it at least acknowledge some of his accomplishments and so-called greatness and, you know, just see things through a different view and perspective. I put chapters in the description below, by the way, if you want to jump straight into when I start talking more about Steven Seagal. But first, and trust me, this all ties together, I'm going to tie in a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of politics, but don't worry, I'm not going to get biased towards either side. Instead, the way we're going to treat this is if you were just thrust into society right now with like a clear mind, free of preconceived biases. Because if you think about it, do we really like what we like and agree with what we agree with because we came to that conclusion ourselves, or have all the outside influence actually made the decision for us? I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking I'm trying to influence you to actually like Steven Skull, but I'm not. I'm just presenting him in a different way, so maybe you could take all the negativity that is associated with him and contrast it with this video, and then, uh, you know, maybe come to a conclusion that he's not so bad after all. So, I consider this video as part of the brain dewashing movement. If it's even a movement, maybe it'll become a movement someday to kind of get people away from the toxicity of mainstream media. Also, throw on Donald Trump and space aliens into the conversation because we're going for originality here. When it comes to perspective and view in general, we all unfortunately fall victim to confirmation bias. Essentially, we're always looking to be proven right. I thought he was invincible. <laughs> the other thought he could fly. <laughs> They were both wrong. But if we have a need and a desire to be right, not only may Steven Seagal throw us through a wall or a window, we will only accept things that validate our point of view. This is a weakness we all have. In fact, studying the philosophy of Bruce Lee, which as a Viking samurai, that's something I kind of had to do, this ties into the whole notion of the usefulness of a cup is in its emptiness. We must leave behind the burdens of our preconceived biases and opinions in order to be free and liberated. The mainstream media, and especially social media companies, are essentially just one giant propaganda machine, primarily left-wing, though there's plenty of right-wing propaganda out there as well, you just have to actually try to find it, whereas the left-wing propaganda generally finds you. Which on a side note is actually pretty ironic because on an overall generic broad level, the conservative party is generally one of personal accountability and working hard in order to become prosperous, whereas the liberal party is generally associated with the welfare state. And just to keep everyone on the same page, the welfare state's definition is as follows. It's a form of government in which the state protects and promotes the economic and social well-being of the citizens based upon the principles of equal opportunity and equitable distribution of wealth. That part's key. You guys stick by me, all that money's yours. The propaganda in general, of course, ties into our own confirmation bias. If you're left-leaning, you're just going to accept what CNN or MSNBC, etc. tells you. Whereas if you lean right, you'll find your own source, tuning into Newsmax, for example, so you can hear and be told things that you already agree with, further justifying that your point of view is right. That kind of ended up being a pun there, your point of view is right. So this is actually a much more complex topic, and I don't want to go down the political rabbit hole too far. I'm merely pointing out the weakness in human psychology. I'll tell you what the real irony is though. Even though it seems as if the two main parties couldn't be more different and divisive, especially nowadays. <laughs> I believe in general, the average American on both sides of the political aisle really want the same thing, a free, just society with equal opportunity to prosper. The two main political parties just happen to be pitted against one another through their ideology, so therefore go about this ultimate goal in completely different ways. I need time to change. I need time. I do too. 
The left still sees the world as if our progress as a country when it comes to civil rights has not gone very far, and as a result, the so-called playing field has not been leveled whatsoever. Therefore, that party resorts to identity politics and victimhood. Their solution to fix this results in taking things away from the more prosperous groups in the country by way of affirmative action when it comes to employment and education, or higher taxation when it comes to accumulated wealth. The right sees things differently. That party is not fixated on identity, by way of gender, race, etc., but rather something each individual actually has control over. Effort and work ethic. Of course I'm painting with pretty broad strokes here, but the point is that finish line, that goal, that objective is essentially the same, so I just find it funny that most people probably don't even realize it. But of course, lots of people just disagree with one another in general. I disagree. Which I'm sure plenty of you guys do when it comes to this video alone. Why is Steven Seagal great? Disagreements are perfectly fine and normal, at least if people can show some level of civility. But therein lies a problem, especially with social media. It seems like people almost have this masochistic tendency to subject themselves to other people's opinions that they find abhorring, which the easy solution is just to unplug from Twitter and Facebook, or at the very least, don't get pulled into those vitriol-filled arguments with people you don't even know and will likely never run across in real life. But even if you did, they're sure to act more civil in person. Financial advisor Josh Brown, who runs a YouTube channel, The Compound, perfectly articulates this point. I'm I'm, bear, I'm bearish on Twitter, period. Outrageous stuff that makes people angry is what gets the most attention. That's literally in the DNA of the platform. And why would – so so Twitter can't change human nature. Right. And so this, this idea of normal people interacting with people who are hidden behind a fake name, like it's, it's not natural. It doesn't make sense. So I don't think – that we should be seeking out these opportunities to interact with each other in this way. They don't make sense. If people are like, why would you take a break from Twitter or whatever? It's like asking me why I would leave jail or why I would walk out of a, a dark alley. I've had enough. Now, I could go a lot deeper beyond this, but we need to start tying Steven Seagal in here. Essentially, that whole basics of political thought spiel that I just gave, which should be thought-provoking for anyone who wants to take a step back and realize that the politicians themselves who create power and the mainstream media who stoke the flames of divisiveness are really just doing the average decent citizen and society on a broader level a great injustice, which is also kind of what happened to Steven Seagal. A lot of the negativity surrounding him and the beliefs people have when it comes to him stem from tabloid journalism, a problem that he's taken issue with ever since since the 90s. And all these magazines think, well, listen, man, if we write all this dirty garbage about somebody, it sells magazines. And then the fans really end up losing because they don't want to, if they see my, my picture on the cover of magazine because they love me, they don't want to pick it up and read that garbage about me. Here's a funny thing, by the way. I noticed on some of my previous videos on Steven Skull, a lot of the comments compared Steven Skull to Donald Trump, and the comparisons weren't meant to be a positive thing. Quite the opposite, in fact. There's definitely a connection between the two men, and you can draw many parallels in how both of them have been portrayed in the mainstream media. As far as the men themselves go, Donald Trump and Steven Skull both seem to have a certain attitude, a swagger, a confidence that they project and it seems to rub a lot of people the wrong way. I don't really think anyone's indifferent towards either man. People feel strongly emotionally towards them. They either love them or hate them. And it should be no surprise both men can be considered anti-establishment, which is why they never got a fair shake in the media news outlets. I think it's outrageous. I think it's a joke. It's disgusting. But on one level, maybe Trump and Seagull's attitude and confidence could be considered justified because, like it or not, they are both very successful. I'm not necessarily justifying it, but ego is an enemy we can all easily fall victim to. When it comes to Trump, even though the mainstream media will never give him credit, Everybody's always blaming me for everything. I almost wonder if history books will be kinder towards him. Whether you like the man or not, and when it comes to Trump, I guess we should say love or hate, any president's administration and legacy should be judged on actual policy. I think critics towards Trump, if they took Trump out of the equation and just looked at criminal justice reform, right to try when it comes to experimental drug treatments for terminally ill patients, the fact that he fought for school choice, which really benefits a lot of lower income minority neighborhoods, and then the four historic Middle East peace deals, which is a great boon for the future of the entire planet. I don't care if Obama got this done, I don't care if Trump got it done, I don't care if Biden got it done. The simple fact of the matter is that it's done, and these will all likely lead to positive outcomes in the years and decades to come. Although Trump comes across as abrasive he is not a warmonger, and I don't think either side, Republican or Democrat, is in favor of his stance because they want to keep the military-industrial complex going strong. And I'm not talking about us as citizens, but rather the politicians with the power. Really unfortunate situation in the sense that uh, even though he was democratically elected, uh, Trump, and um, any decisions he makes, anything he, that he tries to do, uh, he gets blocked uh, so often from, you know, sort of the enemies within. So it's very difficult for him to do anything. 
When it comes down to how people actually interpret things, I find it fascinating how vastly different an event can be seen. And just to really draw the point home on this huge discrepancy, I'll use an otherworldly example. During the Cold War, there were several reports of UFO sightings near nuclear bases. The one in 1967 at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana of a mysterious red glowing object in the sky coincided with 10 intercontinental ballistic missiles going offline. Government officials and the press seen it as a threat to national security. Something really bad, really negative. However, years later, decades actually, when when interviewing several of the witnesses who worked at those military bases, they interpreted things quite a bit differently. They seen it as something positive, as something hopeful in the sense that if we reached DEFCON 1 and ended up seemingly getting to the point of no return, the extraterrestrial presence actually has the means to stop our planet's destruction. Sort of a Hail Mary play taken out of our own species' irresponsible hands. Going back to Steven Seagal, I mentioned his lack of humbleness. As a martial artist, I believe Seagal tends to rub people the wrong way even more than Trump, because being humble is one of the key tenets of martial arts. But I think in an interview Michael J. White gave actually hit the nail on the head when it comes to this. Steven Seagal, he is what he is. He is a movie star. He is a, you know, bigger than life type of celebrity. But he knows what he's doing. He's, you know, he, he knows, he knows what he's doing as far as, um, you know. Many people cite the theory that Steven Skull has just been playing a character in real life, much like his film persona in his early work for 30 straight years. Steven Skull got his fame and fortune playing badasses in movies. When it comes to martial arts, at least in the pre-UFC days, in the era when Seagull made his mark, there was still a level of mysticism around martial arts. In fact, one of my favorite film synopses was on the Van Damme Cyborg, when it referred to him as a quote, martial arts wizard. I don't think Steven Skull ever wanted this mysticism, this idea of martial arts wizardry to ever go away, though he's essentially acknowledged that it doesn't exist in interviews. Anybody, no matter how good they are, can be defeated by even just a lucky punch or being sick that day or having broken ribs or whatever. So I don't think there's such a thing as the greatest of all time. As far as the hatred towards Steven Seagal goes, which I'll quickly address, that tends to stem from a few different things. I already mentioned his lack of, or at least seemingly lack of humbleness. And then there were several sexual assault allegations, most notably from Jenny McCarthy when she auditioned for Under Siege 2. The majority of these lawsuits have been dismissed, so we really don't know the validity of them, and I'm not going to guess whether or not they were true. Now, obviously, if they were true, well, that's pretty shitty, but we can't just assume they were. And then, much like Frank Dukes, people like to point out the various lies that Steven Seagal has made. I kind of feel like there's a kernel of truth in a lot of these lies, by the way. I think he's just stretching the truth, trying to add more legitimacy to his badassness. But I don't think he's necessarily ever needed to. I kind of think a lot of these so-called lies or half-truths just ended up snowballing and taking on a life of their own. You know, we're just trying to come up with the best possible lie. For example, it's reported that Steven Seagal was the first foreigner to operate his own dojo in Japan, which is true, but it wasn't necessarily on merit alone. He married a second degree black belt, Miyako Fujitani, who happened to be the daughter of an Osaka Aikido master who had come to LA to teach Aikido. When she returned to Osaka, Seagull went with her and the two got married the following year. He ended up teaching at the school owned by her family. Now, I'm pretty sure Seagull is more than qualified to teach at that dojo as Japan is a culture that values honor. If Seagull's Aikido skills weren't legit, I don't think he would have been allowed to teach in the family dojo, whether he married into it or not. It's not like that Japanese Aikido dojo is similar to some random dojo here in the US in a strip mall. And then there's a 1988 Los Angeles Times article where Steven Seagal said, You could say that I became an advisor to several CIA agents in the field and through my friends in the CIA met many powerful people and did special work and special favors. There's been much speculation as to whether any of his ties as the CIA are actually true or not. When an interviewer from GQ magazine asked if it was true that he had worked for the CIA, Seagal said, I will not even admit I worked for the government, but I did things I was very, very sorry for. Father, I've lied slept with informants, I've taken drugs, I've falsified evidence, I did whatever I had to do to get the bad guys. Voltaire said, the secret to being a bore is to tell everything. Well, Steven Seagal is certainly not a bore, and at the very least, he's a reserve deputy chief in the Jefferson Parish, Louisiana Sheriff's Office. It doesn't quite have the same ring to it as a CIA, but at least it's something. Oh, that's something. <laughs> In the late 1980s, after teaching the deputies martial arts, unarmed combat, and marksmanship, then Sheriff Harry Lee was so impressed that he asked the goal to join the force. In general, people are going to hype things up. I'm sure everyone's job resume, for example, sounds better than it actually is. I'm not condoning it. I'm just merely pointing out the fact that many people do this. And when it comes to Steven Seagal and to a much greater extent Frank Dukes, they may have just taken it to a much higher level. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's talk about why Steven Seagal is great. One, martial arts. 
He is a legitimate Aikido black belt. Steven Skull is a 7th degree Dan black belt in Aikido. He actually started training in karate and also spent a long time learning Japanese sword, but he's most known for his Aikido. The man is passionate and at a young age made the brave decision to forego college and to relocate to Japan in order to study the art he'd grown to love directly from the Japanese masters. I, d I didn't really graduate from high school, but I took a test to graduate early. He's a high school graduate. Oh. Equivalency. Um, high school equivalency program graduate. And went to Japan and my father kind of helped me. I sold all my musical instruments. And I went to Japan when I was probably 16, uh, 15, 16. By his own account, Seagull battled Japanese xenophobia and had to regularly prove himself in the dojo, battling higher ranked students in brutal contests designed to intimidate him into leaving. But he proved himself and, in turn, ended up becoming a great ambassador for Aikido and was a key player in helping it spread across the world. He's even been asked to teach Aikido to the Serbian Special Forces. A military is not going to waste their time learning worthless technique and skills when it comes to survival. They obviously don't have the time to devote to learning the entire Aikido playbook, and let's be honest, the entire playbook of any martial arts system is likely comprised of several worthless techniques when it comes to legitimate self-defense. But there are enough techniques or modifications to simple the techniques I'm sure Seagull was able to share with the men. Reason number two on why he's great, his movie career. I did a previous video on the best martial arts movie stars of the 90s who weren't Van Damme or Seagull. Essentially, pretty much all those men had a real shot at superstardom, as a major studio backed them and released at least one of the films in theaters. However, those films just didn't end up performing and they never found their mainstream audience, unlike Van Damme or Seagull. So there's definitely something Seagull had, a real star quality. Not only was his first film Above the Lie hit, he followed it up with Hard to Kill, Mark for Death, and Out for Justice, which were all also hits. His fifth film, under Siege in 1992 is really the one that brought him into the mainstream and cemented his legacy as a great action star. He continued to put out quality films throughout the latter half of the 90s such as Under Siege 2, The Glimmer Man, and Fire Down Below. But like other action stars at the time such as Van Damme, Stallone, and Schwarzenegger, the audience for these types of films began to shrink and because these men had less box office pull, they began to show up straight to video. Segola so in 1998 with The Patriot, at least in the US, it was still released theatrically in most of the world. Segola so would have somewhat of a resurgence by teaming up with producer Joel Silver and co-star DMX who was one of the most popular rappers at the time for 2001's Exit Wounds which was a commercial success, however, he was unable to capitalize on the success with his next two projects, Ticker and Half Past Dead, starring opposite Ja Rule, another popular rapper at the time. Pretty much over the last 20 years, he's been going straight to video, several of these films more or less just phoning it in. His name is still marketable though, which is why all these films still get made. But people have recency bias. If you just remember and look at the movies he's done over the last 10 years, then I agree as far as movies go, we shouldn't call him great. But that'd be like remembering Michael Jordan when he came back from retirement to play for the Washington Wizards. Long story short, Jordan will always be great and remembered for the time when he played for the Chicago Bulls. Just like Steven Seagal should always be remembered for his classics in the late 80s to mid 90s, putting him among the greats when it comes to action stars. As far as his acting goes, Steven Seagal has never taken an acting class. This is not the setup for a joke, by the way. So here's the most difficult thing when it comes to acting and how pretty much anyone can immediately spot bad acting. Acting has to be natural. It shouldn't come across as forced. Seagal, in my opinion, has always just come across as very natural, as very relaxed, as very smooth. And I'll tell you why. Superior attitude, superior state of mind. On screen is just very authentic, as in he's there in the moment. That's generally something I believe you can get better at, but for some people like Steven Seagal, the transition to acting is just easy. You could say he's a natural at it. He's quoted as saying, the secret is not to act, but to be. Which is also why he doesn't feel the need to rehearse. And Steve Seagal's like, I don't rehearse, man. He goes, no, <laughs> seriously, just for camera, will you let us rehearse? No, let's just shoot it. He's a great guy, by the way. But acting is one of those things, what works for one person may not necessarily work for another, as I'm sure there are plenty of actors there that would find the craft impossible if they didn't end up rehearsing for hours on end. Reason number three why he's great, he's a passionate environmentalist who's actually done something. And as far as his movies go, it was noble when he tried to use his fame and popularity to get his so-called message movies out there in the public sphere. I give him a lot of credit for using his platform, which funny enough were action movies, to get across something he believes in and that he thinks would result in the betterment of society. This started with his directorial debut on Deadly Ground, essentially fighting big oil. The things he talked about in that monologue at the end of the film in the 90s are now finally coming to see the light of day. The concept of the internal combustion engine has been obsolete for over 50 years. But because of the oil cartels and corrupt government regulation, we and the rest of the world have been forced to use gasoline for over 100 years. 
In fact, leave it to someone like Elon Musk to go all in on this venture of alternative clean energy and in turn begin the process of completely overhauling the entire auto industry. Because of Elon's ownership in Tesla, he's currently the richest man in the world, that stock simply refuses to stop, at least for now. Seagal would follow up his fight against big oil in On Deadly Ground with Fire Down Below where he played an EPA agent fighting industrialists dumping toxic waste in the Kentucky Hills. Although that film was released in 1997, he was excited and talking about it as early as 1991 on the Arsenio Hall show. Um, writing an environmental uh, it's, it's a piece on toxic waste, it's sort of a political thriller, kind of a cross between, believe it or not, Terms of Endearment and Three Days of the Condor, it's that kind of thing. I'm writing that with Jim Carabazos, who's a wonderful writer. He'd follow that up with 1998's aptly titled The Patriot, a film he was so determined to see to fruition that he ended up investing a lot of his own money in the project. That was a commentary on man creating havoc with nature, where he played a doctor who'd have to race against time to find a cure for a lethal virus unleashed by a paramilitary militia leader. I think we all unfortunately bore witness to the type of devastation that sort of event can cause in real life. Reason number four and why he's so great, he's a Russian diplomat who's trying to strengthen the bond between the United States and Russia. In 2018, he was appointed Russia's special envoy to the US. Getting any sort of progress done is obviously a very ambitious goal, but I think it's very noble to at least try. And I think most of the people in the United States of America and most of the people in Russia want to like each other and we need each other. Russia and America should be great allies and that's the way it should be. What everyone really wants is peace. At the end of the day, we're all flawed in some way, some more than others. But if we take a step back and look at Steven Seagal as a martial artist, he's great. You may not think Aikido is great as far as martial arts go, just like you may not think a trumpet is a great instrument because you prefer saxophones, but someone who's great at playing the trumpet is still a great musician, just like Steven Seagal is still a great martial artist. As far as movies go, there are very few men who have ever achieved the level of success Seagal has in Hollywood, and his early films still hold up to this day. They're considered classics for a reason. The fact that he tried to use his reach to further not only a cause he believed in, but a cause that I doubt very few people would deny is overall beneficial for society by way of his environment mentalism, well, that should be applauded. And as far as his Russian diplomacy goes, a positive relationship between the United States and Russia is just better for everyone on the planet, as we should have all learned by now from watching Rocky IV. In here, there were two guys killing each other, but I guess that's better than 20 million. So what do you guys think about Steven Seagal overall? Let me know in the comments below.